everyone, and welcome to the Hey CTO podcast. I'm Pedro Torres. And I'm Sara Gonçalves. And this is a space where you can get to know a little bit better the members of CTO Portugal community. Today, our guest is Hess Chapman. And Hess, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It's a, it's a real pleasure to, to have you here. My pleasure. Hi, everyone. So, Haas, tell us, tell us a, little, a little bit about yourself. So, who, who's Haas and, um, and, um, and, uh, and uh, everything that, that you've been doing uh, lately? <laughs> That's increasingly difficult as I get older, that condensed <laughs> version of, of a half century of life. Um, so, I'm an adopted Swede, um, an ex-vegan punk. I started my career as a software developer in Sweden. Uh, I've been in senior tech management since 2009 where I was head of, uh, head of development at Klarna. I've co-founded my own open source startup. Uh, I now spend my time trying to give back to the tech community wherever I can, and especially in, in Lisbon, in Portugal. Um, and I'm based, though, remotely nowadays in Malta. But I advise and coach startups both formally and informally uh, all over the place. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. There in the middle, you mentioned you right now you own your software company. Could you tell us? No, not right. It's more not right now. That was in the past. Ah, okay, okay. So today is a consultancy, today. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Today I have a consultancy. So uh, I'm basically acting as as interim CTO for a large Kenyan company. They have some exciting plans that I unfortunately can't talk about yet. Um, I'm also a mentor in Mazex, which is a, a Lisbon-based uh, incubator. Um, and also a mentor in Blue Bio Value, which is a, a bio value uh, based incubator. Some very exciting uh, green projects there. Um, I'm advisor to another couple of companies that will shortly launch. And I'm also helping build a platform for founders to find uh, answers to their questions. So whatever those questions may be. Oh, that's, that's super cool. And tell me one thing. Um, just like you mentioned, like your career is it's it's quite quite uh, quite long right now, and and definitely very successful. Um, did you imagine kind of ending up uh, creating your own consultancy gig? So was that something that you know that you let's say in your early twenties or thirties you said you know what like in the future I want to run my own business and 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 do this sort of consultation? You know because you, you've worked in very interesting companies and and definitely become a leader of quite a few. Uh, and right now, in the, you're in a very different flavor of your career, so to speak. Was this something that was, you know, completely planned and it was one of your ambitions? Or was this something that the opportunity just arised? Yeah, I, I, not, <laughs> like not on many levels. Um, so first, I thought I'd be an animal behaviorist. So I studied psychology and zoology uh, at university for a year. Um, that didn't work out because I was vegan and I couldn't do the experiments that the zoology course wanted oh me to do. So I refused on, on moral grounds. So I had to leave. Um, then I worked as a mental health counselor. So I was uh, counseling the mentally ill. Um, I eventually went back to university. I worked as a warehouse worker and I worked at airports, all kinds of rubbish. Um, then I went back to university, got a combined honors in information technology um, and then I went on and started my career as a developer. So uh, I worked at the beginning of the dot-com boom and bust. So that was really uh, interesting. I learned a lot. There was a lot happening there. Um, my career developed and I worked for many years in sec uh, senior tech leadership. And somewhere along the lines, I co-founded my own open source startup and, and, and raised a few rounds. Um, and actually, I planned to retire last year. Like when, when Kazoo acquired oh, wow. Rover, I thought... You know, now I've done enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna enjoy life, um, and I, and I did retire for four months, um, and then, you know, I, I got contacted by a couple of companies that had some very interesting ideas and and plans, and they wanted my help and advice, and so I decided, okay, like let's just start my own company and and do this more formally, so and that's where I am now. <laughs> So is it, is it fair to say that you failed <laughs> trying to retire? <laughs> yeah, I, I failed miserably to retire. I'm, I'm the worst retiree ever. Um, and I still plan to retire. Like, I, I, it just, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but what, what made you so stepping back from the retire? So what was the, the biggest motivation to, to keep you on going and having that will to help uh, the, others? 
There were, no, I mean, like, I always planned to do some advising and mentoring, right, in my retirement. So it was only going to be a semi-retirement. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, just the volume of time that I needed to contribute meant that, like, I'm not, I don't have any retirement. I mean, I, I generally don't work Fridays, really. Uh, I try to keep Fridays clear. I'm reasonably successful at that, although not 100%. Um, and, uh, you know, um, interestingly, the Friday thing comes around from when I was at Drover and, and COVID hit, um, you know, obviously uh, a car subscription service, nobody was, was subscribing to cars because nobody was going anywhere. Everybody was locked in their homes. Right? Um, so uh, like many companies, they took a downturn. And, and one of the ways we, we solved that without having to let a bunch of people go was that everybody agreed to go down to 80%, right? So we all went down 80% in time and 80% in salary. Um, and as I expected from all the talks I've been given my my, my senior career, uh, productivity went up, right? Uh, so so the team was more productive on four days a week than, than five. And so uh, I vowed that uh, from then on, I, I didn't want to work five days a week. No, that, that makes perfect mm -hmm. sense, you know, because that's, you know, I, I, it's funny that we are seeing some studies, you know, I think in Japan, I don't know if in a, a Nordic country as well about, ex, you know, kind of exploring the, the four days of week, uh, almost like if it is kind of, you know, almost like taking the man to, to the moon for a second time. And, and I think that we are now actually kind of gathering enough evidence that it's completely true. Like, we really don't need the five days a week to, to be productive, not, not, not at always more you know, more means more. And sometimes actually kind of, you know, uh, less actually means more. And I, I see that at least even from my personal experiences working four days a week, that the sense of urgency usually rises a little bit more. And we just try to extend the day, the four days a little bit longer if necessary, just to make sure that we get stuff done. And just like you said, I, I really don't see kind of a productivity hit for a four, four days um a week of work. I actually, I'm, I'm completely with you, As I, I actually, I've seen the opposite. I see people happier with more time for their families and, you know, and for their, for their personal things. Um, and that, you know, ultimately translate to re employee retention and, um, and, 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 you know, happier companies, I would say. Yeah. And I think, I think it's also a natural extension of, of, of agile in, the, in a way. Um, you know, focusing on, on impact and business value delivered rather than, you know, how many hours are you sitting in your chair? Like, For sure. I mean, you know, in a, in a cognitive work, so everything involved in software development and running companies, that shouldn't matter how, how long you're there. What should matter is what value are you contributing? And, and really, like, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of extreme case, you know, if my most productive dev by far is actually turning out to work one day a week, I don't care because they're my most productive dev by far. So, you know, um, let's focus on trying to get the job done and, and, and actually adding value and not really care about what, you know, what hours people are working and, and where, or where they are, to be honest, either. So, so. This, is, this is always like a, a, a big discussion around because I, I think there are always advantages and uh, disadvantages depending on the people. I think the best way is being flexible and each one should choose what works the best for, for, yeah. for them. But, uh, but I agree, nowadays the time, <laughs> it doesn't matter. What matters is what you, the value that you deliver at the end of the, of the day. The yeah, and I mean, like, it, it, it's, it's also quite a, um, you, know, you, you can frame the issue as a feminist issue as well. So, you know, there's a lot of women that, that are still, unfortunately, maybe not in the Nordics, but in a lot of other countries, take the bulk of responsibility for the children. I think in the Nordics, it's a little bit more evenly distributed. But, um, you know, if you have flexible working, that enables people to work around their personal schedules uh, mm -hmm. and still contribute value and get senior roles and, and, and do, mm -hmm. do, you know, real work. And I think that, you know, companies that, that are rigid are going to miss out on those people. And I think that's a shame. Yeah, that's true. And so going, going, going a bit further. So you mentioned there are several companies that you already worked on, on, on your, during your long career. 
And uh, do you usually keep track on them? So it's something that you look at them, you see how are they doing, what success they are they are having. How do you look to to their growth? So is it something? Yeah, that yeah, abs on? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so you know, I, I've worked in all kinds of companies and industries. So I've worked in large banks. Um, I've worked for a government authority. Um, they didn't think about growth at all, and they they haven't really grown since then either. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they were big then, and they're big now. Um, but I've also worked for startups that crashed and burned, that did absolutely everything wrong, um, and and you know had less sales than than people I know who sell you know their own stuff out of you know, on an Etsy or something. Um, and I've worked for fast growing startups that had. Uh, you know, phenomenal growth. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, I follow them. Absolutely. And, and you know, Klan is a great example where it's just gone on to unbelievable <laughs> heights. Uh, you know, even I couldn't imagine. I remember, I remember sitting in a meeting at Klarna once and um, our CEO, Sebastian, said that PayPal was 10 times the size of Klarna and growing twice as fast but Klarna would beat them. And I thought, you're crazy, like <laughs> PayPal, come on. And now if you look at it, like he wasn't wrong. Um, so yeah, it's uh, what, I think what, what they taught me most of anything is that a company is often limited by what they believe is possible. And if you just believe that it's possible, that is 50% of getting there. Couldn't agree more. It's a bit like, you know, you know athletes, right? Um, when when uh, there's a world record and it stood for a while, especially when it's like a round number, you know that, that nobody's really achieved this. The four minute mile is the classic back, back when, but there's, you know, the same in, in all events. And, and then somebody breaks it. Somebody manages, right? Like when the first time somebody broke 10 seconds in 100 meters. And, and, and then suddenly everybody can do it, right? Like it's suddenly it's not a big deal. And and I think you know, that's, mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, really, we're held back by our own perceptions of what's possible. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's fantastic. You know, that's actually super funny the the Klarna example, because back in 2013, when when I was at Farfetch, I had exactly the same sort of moment. I remember perfectly being in all hands, <clears throat> Farfetch showing kind of the graphs and showing net apporté, and saying, you know, like net apporté is like. I don't know how big and you know we are growing eventually we'll get there and I, re I remember perfectly everyone in the room thinking there's no way farfetch will ever one a single day become bigger than etaporte you know and guess what you know eight years later not even that i think it was before it just it completely turned around and you know to, to us point i couldn't agree more like if you don't believe it you will never succeed regardless of how odds are in your favor and uh, and no that, what you just said it's like super insightful for sure like mm -hmm. how, how how that connection make a difference between working because you know that you're going to get there versus kind of being afraid and having that sort of mental block that we just mentioned even in sports that it's just holding you back from from achieving mm -hmm. something that you just believe it is impossible and so you know if you believe it it will be for sure mm -hmm. no absolutely Super cool. <clears throat> and some one thing else, now that we're actually talking about, you know, very successful startups, some startups, startups that definitely crashed and burned, just like you said. And, you know, <clears throat> let's face it, uh, definitely we we usually talk a lot about the, you know, the success stories and the ones that, su that succeed and all of that. You know, but it's also true that, you know, for each one that succeeds, a lot of them fail. And maybe, you know, no one tells their stories that probably we should we should also learn a lot from them for sure. Um, you know, with, the, with your experience, you know, from what you've seen so far from working in the ones that succeed, succeeded, the ones that didn't, the ones that are right, super, super successful. We, we also sh could also mention Zinc, for instance, that now it's called New York, if I, if, I, if I recall it correctly. Again, another company that it's really succeeding. What, what do you believe that, you know, that it's the, 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 the most important factor that definitely kind of is going to define if a, if a startup is going to make it or not? So, I mean, obviously there's a bunch of things, right? And it varies depending on the industry and the, and the startup involved. But I think 
the overwhelming number one factor is culture for me. Um, so you can have a great idea, but you need to execute on it, right? And, and that was one of the first things investors taught me when I was having my own startup that, um, you know, ideas aren't worth anything. Everybody thinks that what you do when you go and get investment is you have an idea, you go to an investor and you get money. And, and there's no, almost no investor in the world that will invest in an idea. They don't care. They, get, they see hundreds of ideas a day. They don't care, right? What they want to see is that you can build something, that you can execute, that you can, you know, get traction. And, and the way you do that is, you know, and you can even have a terrible idea. And with a great team, you'll succeed. And I, I think the greatest example of that is Slack, right? Slack crashed and burned terribly as a video game company. But they they built this like product that they used internally to communicate, and they've turned it into a, a billion dollar company. Um, so I think you know you need culture. You need a culture of learning. You need to be fast paced. You need to learn. You need to innovate. Um, and and if you you know if you want your team to innovate, you have to trust them, and you have to not punish them when they make mistakes. So you know if you innovate, you're going to make mistakes. Not all of your innovations are going to work. And you need to be able to, A, identify whether they're working or not. That means you need to do the metrics. You need to, to understand what's happening. You can't just go out and experiment. You have to actually collect the data. Um, but you need to see that your, your innovations work or don't work. Then you need to learn from that. And you need to have delegated authority. Because if every question has to go all the way up to the top to the founders again, and then they decide, you're getting, A, one or two people's ideas about what you should be doing and not, you know, if you have a hundred employees, you, you want all hundred to contribute. Um, and, and secondly, it's slow, right? Like it's super slow and they have to learn, try and learn more and more of the business and that's not possible. So you need to hire a great team, delegate your authority, let them decide whoever's closest to the problem and trust them. And if you have that learning trust culture, I think even if your idea is terrible to start with, you'll pivot. You'll figure out like, okay, how can we pivot? What can we do instead? What works? And eventually you'll, you'll win. But um, if you don't have that, then you can have the best idea in the world and, and you'll be at best mediocre successful. Yeah. yeah. And I, I agree completely with that part of the culture because no, I, I'm at adult systems and I'm seeing a big row in our in our company and we are trying to push to keep the same culture that we had some years ago. But uh, I would like to, to hear from you if you had any tips about how to keep the same culture alive during a, a, a grow of, of mm. a company because it's completely different when you start like with a group of 50 people, you have a culture and then you start recruiting so many and with different, different cultures, with different backgrounds. How can you keep that culture uh, alive? So, so I think I, a couple of things. So I think I, I, I will answer that question, but I will also put a little bit of a twist on it and say um, you don't want to. So the culture you need when you're a 50-man startup and everybody's kind of family and knows everybody else is not the same culture you need to run a successful company with a 1,000 employees. It's why I tend to leave companies because I know that I don't really fit in the culture of a company with a thousand employees. Right? That's not me. Um, so, you know, you should know what cultures you work well in and what cultures you don't and what cultures fit the stage of your company. So, you know, however, there are certain aspects you want to keep the learning, the, the delegated authority, all these things. Um, I think one of the best ways is, is to, to go around the problem. So the problem is when you go from, you know, if you're 50 people, everybody knows everybody else, you can all communicate, everything's really easy. And you may be a couple of teams, you know, it's not a big problem. But once you go to like, you know, say you're 10 teams suddenly, 10 software teams, all working, all trying to communicate, a bunch of other teams in other departments, um, that becomes really, really difficult, right? That communication. And you spend a lot of time just communicating and then you're not doing your job. The managers, the middle management, they just spend all their time in meetings communicating and not actually solving problems. And I think the best way to, to fix that 
is to have business vertical teams. So in, in some companies, they're called pods. In some companies, they're called, you know, tribes. In some companies, they're called whatever. But basically, the idea is um, you build mini startups within your company and you give them responsibility for one business area or channel or whatever, however you divide it up in your company. You give them very clear metrics and goals to reach and you give them complete authority within that. So they basically have a mini CEO in charge of them. And they don't really need to communicate that much outside of their pod. So they are basically like a mini company within the company. And that way they have their culture. They can develop a culture that works for their team and makes them successful. Um, but you don't have this problem of communication that you usually do. And you align everybody with your business goals. So you align them with, with the high level KPIs, the strategic goals of the business, and you follow up on that on a regular basis. Um, but yeah, I think that is the, the way to do it. Yeah. No, I actually one, one thing that definitely caught my mind, and I think it's super clever, that is understanding and knowing which sort of company size we actually work uh, best and we really enjoy uh, working for, you know, because I think that sometimes we have this idea that, you know, that founders or early um, startup employees that they need to go through the entire journey. And don't get me wrong, some of them actually go through that entire journey. But very, very few, like usually what happens, mm. and, and as you describe it so well, like that first team of 10, maybe like two will make it up to the end of the entire journey. Why? Because, you know, the, 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 not that working in a big company is not fun because it is. I'm imagining that working for the, the Googles of this life is also very interesting, but definitely the sort of vibe and the things and the way that you work in a company of 10 people, 20, or maybe even up to 40, it's drastically different. From, from working in a company of hundreds and thousands of people because of bureaucracy, overhead of communication, just like you've mentioned. And, and so it's perfectly natural that, you know, maybe that person, even becoming a CTO of a company of 20 people, might not be the, the, the right level, the CTO for a company of thousands, because even although the name is the, of the role is exactly the same, the duties change really, really a lot. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, totally, totally. Like, the, you know, it's not the same, right? And, 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 and you, there's a lot more freedom in startups. And I think there always will be. You know, once you get to, to several hundred employees, uh, there becomes policies and, you know, they can't make exceptions anymore. And, you know, to get a policy changed is a big deal and a really difficult thing. And they start hiring a different caliber of people that are maybe a little bit more rigid in their way of thinking, not so innovative, um, so, you know, you have a head of HR or it's probably called HR now, where it was called people team before, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, it, it can get frustrating. And I think it's good to, to recognize, you know, like you say, some people make the journey. Like I'm amazed, Sebastian, the CEO of Klarna, he, you know, he was straight out of business school. He founded it with two friends from business school, no prior experience. And, and he's still CEO and doing wow. an amazing job, right? I, I can't believe the growth of that person. Like, I am super impressed. Um, but most of us aren't, aren't that way, right? We, we, we either haven't got the dedication or the time or the competence, whatever. Um, and so, you know, I think knowing your, your sort of where you're comfortable and then when you're hiring, you have to hire for the next phase. So you can't hire people for the phase you're in because by the time they start and get kind of settled in their roles, which takes like six months or something, then you're already at the next stage if you're a high growth startup. So you have to kind of be like, if I'm looking at culture, I have to look at the culture. What do I want in, you know, six months or a year's time? What people do I need in six months or a year's time? Etc. And and I think you have to look at that as an employee as well. Where not where is the company today, but where are they going to be in six months or a year? And then I join that company. Um, you have to look at the aspirations. That's that's super interesting because <clears throat> I think that we all know the the Peter principle, where you pretty much get promoted up to a point where you're incompetent, 
And yeah. also one thing that is super interesting is that the growth of a company can actually kind of cause that, that Peter, Peter principle as well. That is mm. actually, it's not you that there that is being promoted, but the company grows up to a point where you're just incompetent because the company needs someone completely different and, mm -hmm. and maybe it's not your fault. Like maybe, you know, you as a professional or, you know, any of us, we are great uh, on what we do on the very different context that simply the company doesn't have anymore. And, and I think that we as a, even as an ecosystem, we should see that as a natural thing and not something like, oh my God, like, oh, see, that person was fired or he's not, oh, he's incompetent now. No, like it's perfectly fine. Like, the, the person is, it's not the problem. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, it's the context and person that just doesn't. It's not a natural fit anymore. Um, yeah. Really so, so one of the discussion points I've often had with founders, especially or CEOs, is around you know how hands on my role is, right? And um, so I'm very hands off. Like I don't code, I don't project manage, I don't like you know I'm not in the details, right? I, I'm very strategic in in what I do. I mean, I, I I'm involved to some degree you know, architectural decisions I keep track of and jump in if I feel I need to. But but on the day-to-day -day basis, I'm I'm not, right? So if someone says to me, what did the team do yesterday? Unless I've had a catch-up this morning, I don't know, right? I, I know on a weekly basis kind of what the team's doing. Um, so I always talk about it in terms of resolution. So my resolution is a week. I, I don't go deeper than that, really. Um, and um, in, a, in a beginning startup, you want everybody to be hands-on, right? Everybody should be doing something. So marketing is a great example. You want people who actually are hands-on with marketing, who are doing the, you know, the work with Google and tracking and et cetera. Um, but, you know, when you're much bigger, you don't want your head of marketing to be hands, a hands-on person because they're not going to be strategic in their thinking. So you need a person who's a strategic marketing person who has a team who does all the hands-on work. And so if you're growing and then you're head of marketing and you're like, well, we have to get rid of him because he's hands on and we want this other person and she's like totally strategic, you know, and much more senior. That's not, like you say, negative against the person that you're, you're move, either moving out of the role. Usually you have to leave the company because usually if you've been like, you know, head of marketing, right, and then suddenly someone's going to come in above you that's not going to feel comfortable, right? Like yeah. you're going to feel like that's my job. I don't want to work for that person. Um, and you're probably going to leave. Some people can do it, but most people probably can't. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. For sure. Yeah, you, you, you shared already so many lessons, so many <laughs> tips. I, I, I already, I'm already learning with this conversation. So I would like also to, to challenge you. So if you made a little retrospective to your whole career, what do what you do say that would be the the biggest lesson that you learn and something that if it was today you will do it different? So um, I wouldn't do I don't think anything differently. Um, I'm lucky like that. I, I think like that in life and and everything. I think um, I like where I've ended up, um, and so you know my failures have been as important or maybe more important learning experiences as my successes. Um, so I've, I've made some terrible, terrible mistakes. I continue to make terrible mistakes. Um, everybody makes mistakes. It's human. Um, and, and you learn and grow. And, and so if I changed those mistakes, I wouldn't have learned from them. And then maybe I wouldn't be as good as, as, as I am today. Um, so I think, I, I don't think I change anything, but I, I think what I've learned over the years is, you know, the value of relationships. So I was really bad at relationships when I was starting out my career. I'm a little bit uh, autistic in that. I, I have a hard time with human interaction. Um, so when I started out, I was very black and white, very, you know, confrontational. Um, I didn't understand nuance very well. Um, I thought if I got given a piece of responsibility, then I should decide 100% over that. Um, and, and what you learn as you grow up and, and, and become more senior is that actually you decide, like you don't decide anything, right? Like I'm a CTO and I don't get to decide anything. Um, like your team decide, right? Like you, you can't, like, you know, there's always someone else deciding stuff. Um, and what you need to do is you need to negotiate with people and you need to build relationships and build trust. And, and that's really important. And, um, 
it doesn't mean that I can't be kind of harsh with my team when I when I feel it's needed. Um, my job, I you know, one of the things is that people teams have had conversations with me where they're like, you know, I've come into some team that's a disaster. And then six months later, they do like a review. And um, they say to the, the people team, come and tell me that the devs don't really like you. And I'm like, no, of course they don't. I'm changing everything. I'm making their lives uncomfortable. My job is not to be liked. My job is not to be their friend. My job is to make them successful. And that's not the same thing. Right. So I like them to like me. Like I'm like everyone else. I want to be, you know, liked by my team, but that's not my job. And um, so sometimes you have to be a little bit obnoxious and I'm, I'm lucky enough that I can do that. And then with my age and experience, I can temper that somewhat and, and, and try to be, you know, uh, a balance. But yeah, I think um, you know, learning the, the value of relationships and the value of interactions with people um you know, just sitting down, having a one-on-one -on -one with everybody on a regular basis. Um, those things are, are invaluable. Um, there's a thing called the Gemba Walk that I don't know if you've heard of. It's this idea that the CEO walks through the office uh, on a regular mm -hmm. basis and actually stops and talks to people, right? And mm -hmm. that they feel confident in being able to say things to them, right? Not, not just hide. Um, and that's, I think, a really valued thing. Things like that. Things that build your relationship with your employees. No, for sure. Fantastic. No, I couldn't agree more. No, super, super insightful, for sure. <clears throat> and tell, tell us one thing. Yeah. So one thing that definitely really could kind of, you know, um, uh, caught our attention is that you already experienced a very, um, or several, or very uh, diverse uh, communities. So, I, if I'm not mistaken, you know, keep me honest here. You worked in uh, Germany, in Sweden. Uh, I think that you also had a chance in in Spain, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and now in Portugal. Now you're even kind of, you know, you're based in Malta. I don't know if also you have any sort of contact with the the the, the, the Malta ecosystem. But where do you see, you know, the the, the Portugal tech scene? Because I think that you arrived around 2010, more or less. And so definitely you've seen at least almost like a decade of, 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 um, of evolution. What's, what's your take on the, on, the, on the Portuguese ecosystem? Yeah, so the, I mean, I haven't quite spent that long in, in Portugal, but, but yeah, I spent a good time there. I think, um, so the, the, the big thing that I see in Portugal is, is that it's, it's, it's really interesting. So um, there's a lot of talent. I think the schools are really good. And, and people work really hard. Um, luckily for Portugal, you don't dub anything on TV, which means most people speak fairly good English, um, which as, as the, you know, everything becomes more global, that's really important. Um, I think that's certainly why a lot of companies are basing themselves there, um, um, which that's a big difference between Spain, for instance, where language is a really big issue. Uh, trying to find uh, employees that can speak English is difficult. And therefore, the Spanish kind of scene and the foreign scene are very separate. I think in Portugal, they are separate, but they're more close together. So, for instance, the Portuguese startups and the foreign startups, they can swap people fairly easily. Um, I, th I think it's, um, you know, in the culture, you're quite humble and pragmatic people. And, and that shows in the teams. So the teams I've led in Portugal have been, you know, pragmatic and, and, and humble people. And that helps teamwork and it helps them grow. And, and from a total scene perspective, the Lisbon scene, for me, it reminds me of Barcelona many years ago, uh, when Barcelona was just starting out and growing. Um, it has huge potential, I think, like enormous potential. Um, and, you know, the universities are good. The government's putting in really good policies as regards tax rebates for development teams, R&D teams. Um, I know one of the companies I'm advising is planning to set up a team in Portugal because of those rebates. Um, so it really, really works. Um, so, yeah, I think it has all the potential in the world. And I, I'm like I'm thinking about recruitment for, for teams I run, even remote teams. And, and one of my go-tos is to hire from Portugal. Wow, fantastic. That leaves me happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. It's great for everyone. Sure. Yeah, this is great to know. And um, yeah, so yeah. I would like to, to, to start uh, getting into 
two questions, the final ones, <laughs> to close this, this conversation that is being so inspirational. And uh, again, I, I already learned uh, a lot here with, with you as with such a big experience and with so many tips. It's really great. And I hope that the people that are going to listen to this, epi this episode feel the same. For sure. Um, so reaching out to these final questions. The first one is interesting. So imagine that you are, for instance, in Portugal, <laughs> that you could invite someone to, to have dinner with. Who would you choose? <laughs> Reflection moment. Yeah, I have to think about it. Okay, uh, Duncan Jones. You know who Duncan Jones is? Not no. at all. He's a uh, film director and the son of David Bowie. Um, oh, wow. So he, di he directed Moon and Mute and Warcraft. So I don't know if you've seen any of those, but um, yeah, he's a very talented, in my view, uh, screenwriter and film director. And I mean, being the son of Bowie must be an experience, you know, fairly unique in the world. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have dinner with him. I think there's a... I, I'd be really curious about his experience. Are you are you a Bowie uh, fan? Also, is that something that kind of, if you look kind of, you know, in the way that you, you pretty much your background and the way that you, do, do you see Bowie as someone that influenced you uh, throughout your life somehow? Or were you just No, fan? not really. I mean, I like Bowie's music. I think he was talented. Um, certainly the early stuff. I think the later stuff is a bit depressing for me. But but um, no, I, I just think like, you know, growing up in the shadow of somebody who's, you know, obviously one of the greats of all time in any field, whether it's, you know, they're an athlete or whatever. That's I think that's a uniquely challenging thing to do um, mm -hmm. because I would feel me. I would feel like I can't do anything. Like there's no point. Like I'm I'm never going to be great. Like, how, how could I possibly, you know, compete with that? That's incredible. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I just like to know how it, how it influenced his choice of career. You know, does it open doors for him? Because, you know, he knows all these people because he went to fancy schools in Switzerland or whatever. Um, and, and then how he, how, you know, because he knows Bowie as a person. He doesn't know him as... As Bowie, he knows him as yeah. dad, right? Like you know, and it's it. I, I am always fascinated by celebrities that their family for their family they're just normal people. They're not like special, you know. <laughs> yeah. And 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 for us, they're special. And you know, they even have celebrity icons, right? That they're like, oh wow, if I if I got to meet, you know. So it's it's you know, it's just a reminder we're all human. So I just think it would be really interesting. And I, I really like the movies. That's the main reason. So I'm, I'm a big, <laughs> big fan of his movies. I think he's a really talented director. So, no, very well, for sure, super cool. <laughs> um, so I think that we can go to to the last question, though. So, the last question that we have here is: It was brought to our attention that you know, in the past, I don't know about now, but definitely in the past, you are a militant anarchist uh, vegan. Uh, yes. So that was definitely something that really sparked our curiosity. Yeah, I'm curious I'm, about this. I'm going to be honest. I don't know what that is. I'm pretty sure that if you if you if you were one of those, it's a, that's at least super interesting and exciting. So you know, I'm all ears. Yeah. Please let us know more about that. So I was yeah I I was a, a punk and uh, I was a communal anarchist, which means. Um, you're kind of believing in self-organizing and you don't believe in those in power. You don't trust them. Um, I was an animal rights activist. So I went on demonstrations. I did one or two things that I probably shouldn't have, um, <laughs> you know, to people who maybe didn't deserve it. Um, I, I was, yeah, I believed in animal rights and that animals should not be killed. And as far as I was concerned at that time, that was the same as, as slavery in, in you know, moral terms. So, you know, almost by by any means necessary to stop it. Um, and uh, yeah, it was an interesting time. I, I I'm I'm lucky. I was never arrested. 
which is amazing. Uh, <laughs> wow, I, should I be scared? I've been punched in the face by policemen a lot. Um, oh, Jesus. So, and I've been threatened by them. So I don't have a great relationship with the police. I, I'm, not a, I'm not particularly friendly towards the police. But, um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting times. I, I now am a great aficionado of, of steak and, and, and red wine. So um, oh, I'm not a vegan wow. anymore. Ah. So that that's that's <laughs> the living proof that you know people change, right? So definitely, yeah, yeah. so you so actually, I, I use this a lot. Actually, people say like, "Oh, I'll, I'll never do X, Y, Z," and I'm like, "You don't know. Like, you have no idea where you're going to be in 20 mm -hmm. years' time, like emotionally or your beliefs. Even like things change a lot. I mean, I, I I've got long hair. I've cut this off four times in my life." <laughs> Um, completely and, and, and started again so you know and I never thought that would happen and the last time I didn't think I'd grow it again so who knows you know I still feel like anything is possible I have no idea where I'm going to be in, in 10 years or 20 years time fantastic there you go cool that you shared that I, I haven't noticed on the video no no no, yes, no. <laughs> super modern look um, yeah. Look, it was so much fun um, to be with you, us. Um, you know, like the, the, the today, today's episode, it's pretty much at the end. Um, you know, this this definitely was was fantastic to you know to have a little chat with you, to know you a little bit better. Definitely, a lot of insights that were shared here that I think that are extremely valuable to to anyone can, that can that can listen to the to the to this episode and you know and again like uh, by all means you know if you're a startup if you want to get some advice for someone as knowledge as us you know i'm pretty sure that you'll be completely available within reach you know and linkedin or any other way to to be contacted but you know i think that definitely he's someone that is um that is very um worth it of of of, of reaching out to and to and to and to work with um with that being said Uh, thank you everyone for watching. Um, we hope that you got some insights and definitely a lot of inspiration. And we hope to see you again in the next episode of Hey CTO. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.